Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the power course. So yesterday you saw all the theory that you needed for knowing what you see today. Who was not there yesterday? Oh, a lot of people. So I assume you have basic console knowledge and you're here to apply these. All right, so today's course is based on a lot of brainstorming. It's basically a big chaos that we collected from all possible sources. We asked people on Reddit, uh, we asked people in real life by email, etc., etc. The whole team contributed. We took all these ideas and then I tried to somehow synthesize them, put them into an order. There are three categories of things we're going to show. One is being the basic stuff that you can already do, advanced stuff which you can easily read your way into, and then of course some really expert knowledge. And there's there are some ideas what you could do with your Linux system. Of course, uh, it's by far not exhaustive. Uh, it's just going really quick over the things. My name is Sandra. I'm a computer science student at sixth special semester at ETH Zurich. This is Tux. He is the official Linux mascot. Okay, so today we are supposed to motivate you. We have seen many people in the past who actually kind of lost their touch with Linux because they didn't know what to do with it. Um, so this course is for people who are already interested into Linux in order to, uh, to discover how to go further. So the goal is really to get you started on a track that will lead you to excellence. But this is just a really, really quick beginning. Uh, but f from here on you will be able to go as far as you probably want. So these are some insights to give you more or less a feeling of what your Linux, day, what your Linux life could look like. And so as far, as far as right now probably you don't you're not very inspired, but I hope that after this course you'll get some ideas and afterwards, with experience, there will be more and more ideas of how you could uh, adjust your daily life to make it even more efficient. Uh, in, the, in the next few years, if you keep using Linux, I think you will definitely change a lot of your workflows in order to be more efficient. Okay, um, so we will have a, a little bit of talking about other operating systems. Uh, it's not supposed to be a flame war, but I'm just I'm just going to be comparing against them. So no insult. Okay, so your goal is to love that new system, as you can see with our president here. Um, I included that picture because lots of the things I'm going to show are from her computer. Okay, so let's start with the basic part. First of all, this everybody knows. Uh, Zipper. Who, who is not familiar with Zipper? Okay, who doesn't know what a package manager is? Okay, so um, Zipper is the package manager of OpenSUSE. Um, it has three commands that you can know, well, two commands that are important, ref for refresh, like that's like sudo apt-get update on Ubuntu, and up for update, which is sudo apt-get upgrade uh, on Ubuntu. So, uh, of course, we can do this unattended. Our goal is right now, in this, in this example, imagine you come home from a long journey, you've been away in vacation or something for several weeks, and there are lots of updates which are out there, which have to be installed on your computer. And it's really late, you want to go to bed, so you want your computer to run and do the updates by itself. But uh, you don't want your computer to be running all night long, because you know it probably takes five or ten minutes to install these updates. You want the computer to shut down automatically after that. And this is how you can solve that. First of all, you become with sudo su administrator permanently, like we learned yesterday. And after that, you, uh, you don't have to use sudo anymore. The reason why I become uh, sudo permanently is that some sudo commands they expire after a time. Uh, if you use sudo and then you don't use sudo for a while, you will have to enter the password again. We don't want that since the computer is supposed to be unattended. So we just become su uh, administrator per root permanently and we don't have to worry about timeouts anymore. So once we, are, we see this uh, hashtag, we know that we are root and uh, we can just go zip ref. And now there is an operator which I have not showed you. Actually, you can link commands together. Like, there are two ways of saying after this, do that. One is separate them by a semicolon. Uh, that's just no matter what happened, just do after this has completed that. Or we go with and and. Uh, we have here these two ends. This a command, once it has finished, it will return with a value, which is just a, an integer number, which can be zero or something else. And it's a convention. And again, it's only a convention. The programmer specifies what he wants to do. Um, as a convention, if a program succeeds, it returns zero. And if there's a failure, it will return some other number, which then you could look up in the manual of the, of the program what it stands for. So and and is special. It looks at return value of the last command. And if it is zero, 
it will keep on with the next command. But if it's not zero, it will stop. So that's nice if you cancel something. Um, many programs will return minus one or something like that. And so everything else would not be executed. Because else if you have this up and running and then you cancel it, it will go to the next, to the next command. With and and, uh, this will not happen. So uh, zipper up is what you probably already know, but there is a dash n, which is just a single option for non-interactive. So that means unless something is really wrong, just don't ask for confirmation. You remember probably a zipper asks you, do you really want to do that? This is what I, would, what I have prepared for you. You say enter. With the n option, it will not do it. And then power off is a command that uh, I think under SUSE you need to run a su uh, super user, but we are already. So that's perfectly fine. It will turn off your computer immediately. And that's it. Check for updates, install updates, and shut down after that. OK, now um, another thing that is very useful, probably used sometimes, is an ad hoc network. Um, who does not know what an ad hoc network is? OK, um, so you have probably created a Wi-Fi. Uh, have you created a Wi-Fi on your laptop before? Who has done that? Just a few, OK. So you know, the laptop has wireless card. And this wireless card can receive, but it can also send. And th if you have a more or less OK wireless card, you will be able to be not only the client getting wireless from, uh, from a router, but you'll also be able to create your own wireless so that your laptop becomes like a router. And that is called an ad hoc network. Actually, ad hoc networks are special. They're not like the, the usual wireless that we get here. The special wireless type that is produced by your wireless card, even though it's not a, a normal router, OK? Most wireless cards can do that. So on the Windows 8, they removed that, unfortunately. So Windows 8.1 or Windows 10, they don't have that feature anymore. And uh, so back in the old days when we were still gaming in the train, remember? Yeah? No? OK. Anyway, um, so just created a wireless, ne wi wireless network and then hooked all the co other computers to the one that had the network. And we could game uh, online, even though we had absolutely no internet. Like train rushes through the tunnel, doesn't matter because the wireless is inside and we didn't need a router for that. And so we were uh, very upset when it was removed in Windows 8. There's a console hack to get it back, or you just use Linux. So um, most of you, probably even all of you, have for internet a program called Network Manager. Now, this program usually shows up, uh, for me, it's the bottom right. It's these, these little bars that you can see there. It's really small. This is where you go and check for your available network connections. Looks like that. OK, this is Network Manager. Basically, this is just an applet. Network Manager is a, is a daemon, a program that runs in the background. So here, I just pick whatever wireless I want to connect to. Or in the very bottom, I see Create a new Wi-Fi. And if I click that, I can create my own wireless going out, and then other people can connect to this. Note Android devices uh, or iPhones can have trouble connecting to a wireless that you create ad hoc, because it's a different protocol. But um, we, for example, Linux to Linux works very well, and Linux to Windows usually too. Um, now, there's another use case that can be interesting at times. That is, for example, hi, Dorian. I have a, a, a Raspberry Pi. And this Raspberry Pi ha is old, like not three, you know, it's just old style. All it has is an LAN connection, and I have to connect an Ethernet cable to it to get it online. And I'm sitting in the train, and I want to somehow communicate with that Raspberry. So I cannot really give it wireless connection to it because it doesn't have no wireless. So what I can do is I take a cable, and I plug in one end of my laptop and the other end of my Raspberry. And here again, usually, when you plug in a cable into your laptop, it tries to get an IP address from that cable being the client and talking to the router. But Network Manager can do the other way, too. So it can give, produce um, an outgoing Ethernet signal and doing itself the address handling, DHCP, etc. cetera. So um, how do we do that? When you click right on, a, on your uh, Network Manager, Depending on your distro, it might be left-click. You can go Edit Connections. And in that, you can add a new connection. And you can say Ethernet. And now this, usually, if you just press OK, um, this is a client side. So that would be, uh, if I press that, it will attempt to get an address from an Ethernet cable. But if I go to IPv4 settings, I can say Method, Shared with other computers. And then this will create a new connection. And as soon as I... I plug in uh, an Ethernet cable. Um, let's see, maybe I'll, I even have one here. That would be lovely. Uh, apparently, they don't like me that much. Okay. 
So whenever I connect uh, an LAN cable to it, um, there is in this menus of available wirelesses, you see here is the riot network. It will uh, my new connection will show up, and I can just press it, and then I'll be a server, and then my Raspberry Pi will automatically get an IP address associated to it. Uh, note that for a Raspberry, you have to unplug the cable and plug it within two seconds again, so that Raspberry actually tries to acquire a new address. So um, this is a screensaver, <laughs> probably the ugliest one I know. Um, okay, this is about. So, e by the way, even uh, my, my wireless connection that I get from ETH, I can forward it through my LAN port. And some of you didn't have a working wireless, um, so I just took their laptop, and plugged it into mine, and mine would just be the relay between wireless and a LAN network to the laptop. It can, it can get very useful, and network manager can do that over, uh, over a GUI. Okay, so another thing I particularly like about Linux is that you can get rid of things you dislike. So, for example, who, who of you is using XFC? Okay, just a few. So let me explain this really quick. You probably know this. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, you have this extraordinary ugly start menu here, which I particularly dislike, even though I am a fan of XFC. Um, this start menu, in my opinion, is unacceptable. Um, it's just too old. Nowadays, there should be a more modern start menu. So what we can do is you open up a console and you go sudo zipper. Oh well, let's let's first search. There's a menu called Whisker menu. So you can search for Whisker, and you see here there's this XFC4 panel plugin Whisker menu. I select the text, and as soon as I finished selecting, it's already copied into the primary clipboard. So what I can say now is sudo zipper in, and I paste with a middle click. It's like on the scroll wheel. And of course, I have to enter my password. And as you see, uh, it finds it, installs it right away. And now I have this whisker menu. How do I find it? If you right click into the bar, you go panel, add new items. And you will see by typing whisker this, and you just drag and drop it wherever you want it. For example, here in the bottom left. And now this is what I call a much more useful uh, start menu, where you can just type to, to get your stuff working. So this is, um, actually, we, uh, we should have made this as default. Anybody getting an XFC installation by us should have Whisker menu on board. If not, I really strongly recommend it. Uh, it has only advantages, in my opinion, over the old style menu. And of course, it has a configuration dialog um, where you can set some basic settings. Now, assume that this is not enough for you. Like, there are not enough options. There are many, many different um, start menus that you can have. You can have them both installed, more installed. You can have five start menus installed if you want to. For example, Kopfer. Um, Kopfer does not have a, uh, a, like a field where you can type your text. Instead, you can just, when you, when you launch it by a custom keystroke that you define in Kopfer, um, you can just start typing. It will search your documents, it will search your programs, and so on and so on. And as you see, it has a plugin system. So it is highly configurable, and it has uh, many capabilities. So now assume that this is not enough nerdy for you. Um, for example, I don't use any of those. Uh, I had copper back in the old days, but nowadays I'm using something more minimal than that, namely D menu. Like all this feature thing, like the graphical thing and so on, uh, started to, to drive me angry because it takes up a lot of space. Why not go minimal? So my start menu looks like this. Did you see anything change? Okay, so at the very top there is a bar, and this is D menu. Okay, so that one. Now I can type whatever I want and start it. This is rather minimal. Now probably, well here, like, like the way I have it, it's extremely slim and it can do pretty much nothing except for starting commands, which is not for me, but of course um, you can install plugins. And here, for example, who of you knows dictleo.org? Yeah, half, wow, okay. Um, there's a plugin, apparently. Um, I found this screenshot online where they go immediately online and you can search in that stupid menu that you saw on top, that minimal looking thing, you type your search term of, uh, of what you want, and it will di directly translate it to German. So probably things are not as uh, small as they look like. Same thing with clipboards. Control C, Control V, you know. Now we have showed you uh, select and then paste with the middle click. These are the two default clipboards that you have. Each of them can hold exactly one item. Maybe, so, so 
In some, of course, you can have two items, but maybe that's not enough for you, especially since nowadays we copy pictures, we copy web pages, we copy everything. So um, there's a clipboard, a multiple clipboard called Glipper. It's very small. Glipper um, will hold the last 10 or whatever you specify things that you have copied with Control C or with MailQuick. Um, then you have a, on the top bar, he, this is a Ubuntu screenshot, on the top bar you have the symbol and you just select what you want and then with Control V you can paste. So that way you have a, a clipboard history. And if that is still not enough for you, this is what I use, this is CopyQ, that's a, the most advanced clipboard manager that I know. Um, still it looks the same, but this time you see it can also memorize uh, pictures. And also what's very important, if you click it, instead of dragging it down or right clicking it or that again depends on your distro. It will show up as a as a window, and you see that it holds text, it holds links, it holds formatted HTML web pages, pictures, etc., etc., etc. And then here you can save things, you can save your and organize your your clipboard items uh, and much much more. Uh, and yet it is very fast. I'm really a big fan of this uh, of this tool. Okay, now let's talk about file managers. This is Windows Explorer or on Macintosh it's uh, Finder. Here, this is a file manager called Nemo uh, on Linux Mint. This is the default uh, on, a, on a Cinnamon uh, desktop. So here, cool features that Nemo has, it, you, can tie, you can put it into two, like um, with F3, you can split it, so you have left and right side, or it has tabs. Uh, most of you probably also have that, but Control-T opens a new tab. Uh, and then, of course, it's very powerful with networking and stuff. Um, if you don't like it, there are many, many different uh, file managers that you have. XFC users have Tunar, um, KDE users has Dolphin, GNOME users have Nautilus, uh, Nemo itself is, again, based on Nautilus. This is Space FM, uh, a much less known file manager. There are dozens of them out there, probably even hundreds. So you see it looks much different. There's less eye candy. Um, what is special about it is that it shows you lots of information at once. So if you don't care about eye candy, apparently people are more efficient on this one than uh, on, a, on a regular file manager. Or if you want to go even more down, this is a console file manager. So because you don't necessarily have to go CD all the time, you can have a file manager like this. It's called Ranger. Uh, again, this screenshot is from Alin. And you see it even displays pictures. And you can have all of them installed if you want to. OK, now the shell. Um, yesterday we learned about Bash. It's not the only shell. There, again, are dozens of shells out there. Um, bash, you remember this control R thing, etc. You can also style it using bash RC. This, again, is a screenshot from Alin. If a command returns successfully, like a zero value, it will smile at you. And if something doesn't go well, it will be angry. So, uh, by the way, this is cow say, um, which is a program that displays any text as a cow saying that. That's why it's called cow say. Um, yes, so bash, bash can be configured. Uh, it's just whatever way you like it. Or you do something different. For example, this is what I use. Um, I'm a little bit ashamed of using that because this is what people use who don't know how to use a console. Yet I find it extraordinarily handy because it just helps you all the time and yet it's not very aggressive. This is fish, the friendly interactive shell. So um, if you don't want to edit co uh, configurations in your, uh, in your console, Fish actually produces a website to configure it. Um, and also, well, this, this you really don't need. I mean, colors, etc. Okay, if you, if you like that. I think more important is that it auto-completes things while you type, so you don't need tap-tap. But if you do tap-tap, um, it will help you displaying things more, much more detailed. And everything is colorful. Um, I think it's, it's a little bit more user-friendly than Bash is. Again, you choose what you pick. And then if you want to go really advanced, this is uh, what I should have been using instead of fish. It's Z shell. This is kind of the Chuck Norris of the shells. It's a really powerful shell. Um, you can see here, um, this is Git. Who knows Git? Quite a few. Oh, wow, amazing. So Git is integrated in the shell and will tell you anything that you want to know. And it has tons of plugins. Uh, it's very, very highly customizable. I, I think some people say that Zshell is an operating system on its own. But so it's, to me, it's way too much. I don't need that much of a shell, but maybe someday I'm going to be frustrated to change to that. This is really all the way you can go. 
Okay, now Tmux is not a shell. Tmux is a container for shells and it has some cool features. One is that you can display multiple shells in one console. Um, so, for example, if you have, if you're working on a f on a machine abroad, um, this gets in very handy because you don't have to connect to the machine twice to get two windows open. Um, also, if your connection crashes, Tmux will stay alive and keep doing what it did before, even though there's no more connection to the user. And you can simply reattach it by going Tmux -a. Uh, so this is kind of a, a fail-safe uh, console wrapper that you can put in. And again, it's highly configurable. Um, this is what it could, for example, look like. Now, this is probably one of the no nerdiest screenshots I'll show you tonight. I found it online. Um, you see that guy even has a visualization in a console for his music playing. Um, yes. You can do that if you want to. Here's the Gen 2 enthusiast. We do have one, too. Okay, um, so let's go a little bit technical. DD um, is a program called Disk Destroy. I don't even know its real name. Um, but basically what it does, you know, the lowest level that you can have are ones and zeros. Then on top of that, we have partitions. On top of that, again, we have uh, file systems, and then there are the directories and files and so on. DD is really on low level. It operates either on devices, the lowest possible, or on partitions. Um, so it can do many things. It can copy uh, data, re really data, because it doesn't care what data is. It just sees ones and zeros um, from disks and two disks, uh, files, USB sticks, and also you can forward things to commands. Now, let's have a little bit look at that. Um, if I want to do an exact copy of my USB key onto my hard drive, I can use DD. And then the hard drive will look exactly like the USB key. I can do that with the entire device or just with a partition. I can create a backup of my key to a file, or it doesn't have to be key or anything, it can be CD as well. So you know, you know ISO files, right? Who knows what an ISO file is? Okay, um, DD can create ISO files. So this is really a one-to-one -one copy of a CD. DD takes whatever is from the source device, which would be then the CD, and puts it into a file, which will then be an exact copy. The other way is not possible, because CD is not written as CD is burned, okay? You need burning software for that, of course. Um, so, and commands are useful when you want to do something with that data flow that you have. For example, compress it. Um, we're going to have a look at that. Uh, very soon. So this is uh, how, did, how you talk to DD. You specify IF and OF, input file and output file. Now why is it called disk destroy? It's called disk destroy because the output file will be overwritten, no matter what it is. Even if it's the, 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 your main disk, you remember in Unix everything is, almost everything is a file, um, with that slash def thing. I told you yesterday these are, everything shows up as a file. So with DD, you can access all the devices that Linux gives to you as files, which is pretty much anything. Um, and that's why it's called input file and output file. And if you specify as output file dev SDA, which is your primary hard disk, then um, you're going to do it like me and end up with a completely broken computer. It doesn't ask for confirmation, it just does it, okay? And that's why they call me the great chairman, because I was so smart of destroying my own computer. That's why it's called Disk Destroy. I didn't invent that name, by the way. Okay, um, there's another option you can give, this BS. Uh, it's probably not what you think. This stands for block size. Um, four megabyte is a decent block size. One megabyte would be enough, too. Basically, if, if you don't give that to DD on some distributions, it will copy a little bit and then write it to device, get a little bit, write it to device, and nowadays with buffers, the performance is not really good at that. So, however, if you give 4M, we will read a 4 megabyte large block chunk and write it right ahead. So the buffers will, will be uh, used in a more optimal way. Basically, if you specify this, you get a speed up of two or even three times faster speed uh, on USB keys, for example. So you're never wrong to use it, I think. And now there's a brand new feature after like over 20 or 30 years of waiting time. There has been a uh, feature really, uh, released that was added to that, it's status equals progress, and then it will tell you how, how far it is. It will tell you I have copied so much. Um, that's, that's nice, Bef because before you just started it and you waited two days and eventually it will complete, that's all you saw. Now you can have a progress bar. Okay, so um, concretely we can use it like this. For, of course, sudo is uh, required because we're going to do system, uh, system changes. So 
In my computer, the CD is called Def SR0. Sometimes it's called Def CD or Def DVD. And the output file here is actually a file. So again, Def SR0 is a file that represents a CD. And I can read from that file. DD does not know that this is a CD. It just takes it as a file and reads it from the lowest level. Uh, it works exactly like CP. It takes everything there is and puts it the other way, just on a lower level. And here, this is an output file, and what's going to happen is we create an ISO of the CD. So if you have your favorite uh, program CD, your gaming CD, and it is not uh, copy, copy protected, that way you can back it up. Because this is going to be exactly on the bit precise what that is. Okay, um, another a great thing you can do with DD is you take. Question. Yes, a question. Yep. The output file does not have to exist. The DD will create the output file if it doesn't exist, or if it does exist, overwrite it without asking for confirmation. The source file shouldn't be. I mean, if, the, if I want to copy a CD or a USB that is copy protected somehow, oh. but this is low level, so it shouldn't be a problem. It shouldn't be a problem with right, uh, copy protection usually on CDs, but they have been very smart people. Um, I think, I, I don't know exactly how, what they did, but I, I tested it, and I, the only explanation I can get one CD that I had that I wanted to copy, um, they made one sector on that CD broken. And the program, when it starts, will try to read that sector, and if it succeeds, will crash. <laughs> so you cannot emulate a broken sector with DD, because the DD sees either ones or zeros, not a read error, right? So even if you, if you use DD RISC-Q, which will see to copy the entire disk, there is still, the, the program will detect that you copied it. So yes, there is possibility still to have copy protection, even though we are operating on a low level. It's, people are smart out there. <laughs> Any further questions? Okay, so this is another use case. This time I have a, a CD image, uh, which is by chance the OpenSUSE install medium, which you download from OpenSUSE. But instead of burning it to a DVD, I mean, who does DVDs nowadays? Most of your computers don't even have a drive. What we're gonna do, we're gonna put it onto a USB drive. And that we can do easily by instead of giving that to a burner, we put it, we give it as input file to DD, and as output file we give out the first, uh, the second device connected to the computer. Um, if you have two hard drives, that will kill your second hard drive, so there's a command called lsblk, list block devices. It shows any devices that you have with the sizes, so always check that first to know where you are writing to, to be sure that the size matches what you expect from USB key. And so to my laptop, this will be the first USB key play being plugged in. Again, block size 4 megabytes for speed up. And then this will actually contain the exact bitwise copy of the OpenSUSE install CD. You plug it in your computer, you boot it up. Um, this does not work for Windows installations, though. Um, they are protected against it because they don't want you to copy it. Um, another important thing is many people do the error, especially like young, not very experienced, but still courageous Linux users, they put a one here because they're used to writing something to a first partition. Um, if you want to copy a CD, you don't want to be that written to a partition, but you want the entire device to become that CD. That's why we omit the one and just write SDB on the entire device. All right, um, now one more tweak that there is. Okay, something I didn't tell you, because it's rather advanced, you can forward output in commands. Yesterday I told you you can chain commands. When you do that, for example, it looks like this or like that. This, what it's going to do, it takes whatever, produce, uh, whatever the data produces a program and forwards it to some other program. And this takes the output of a program, which would appear in the console, and writes it to a file. So what we are doing now is, again, dd, input file def sda, which is uh, my primary, I think this is my boot, my boot partition. And I want to have an exact copy of that. But my boot partition is, well, it's not that large, but imagine it could be large, and it contains lots of zeros, because there's just empty space wasted, you know? So I don't want, but when I copy a four gigabyte USB key to a file, that file will be four gigabytes large on the, on the bit 
because it's a bitwise copy. So that is a waste of space, because all the space that hasn't been taken up on the device, I don't want that to be taken up on my hard disk either. So you can pro compress data on the fly. So what you do is you, you hand that over to some command, any command that can zip things. For example, zip. That would probably work. Um, it's a really stupid idea to do it. I will tell you in a second. And then this is actually going to output all the ones and zeros to your console, which is probably not what you wanted. So you want to forward that output and write it to a file. And then for your own convenience, you uh, add dot .zip, so you know that this has to be unzipped before dd again, extract it again to somewhere else. OK, so, so far everything clear? Anybody not clear? OK, if you're not clear, really lift up your hand. I know you are used to being blamed for not knowing things. Here, everybody is friendly, so don't be afraid. This is your only way to stop me. OK, I assume everybody is clear. So why is zip a stupid idea? Zip uh, actually is single threaded. That means it runs on exactly one process. And one process can only be, one, one thread can only be handled by one processor. Now, processors don't get any faster anymore. A little bit, not much. And performance is really a problem with processors. The clock speed has lit, uh, reached its physical limits, and you know hardware people are kind of desperate. So what they do is, instead of having one processor, they put several processors on your computer. This machine has four processors. Called, it's called a quad core. And then some uh, more recent computers have eight or 16, or servers even, even more processors. I know systems which have 32 processors on one chip. It's like cra really crazy. Even a Raspberry Pi has four processors. So with Zip, nowadays, you don't get any performance. What's going to happen is your disk is going to deliver. And you're going to be very happy with that. And then everything needs to be slowed down so the processor can take care of the bits and nom, 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 consume them, compress them, and output that again in data flow. So this really slows you down. But now, um, PBZip2 is one of the programs, it's not the only one, it's one of the programs that can concurrently compress on the fly a single stream. So you have one stream of data, and it goes into PBZip2, and it uses several processors, as many as necessary, to consume that data concurrently, in parallel. And then it all puts it again out, onto that, uh, which, which will then be forwarded um, to our output file. And this is actually so performant that on my computer, uh, on a, with a standard USB key, even if it's a fast one, I only get about 25-30% uh, of CPU uh, load compared to zip, which is limited to 12.5 to on mine. So I can copy on the fly, compress on the fly while at full speed, while the copy is going on, compress all that data and output it again without any slowdown. Uh, I think that is something quite remarkable. So that's, that is why it's always good to think about things like that. You get a massive speed up. Okay, I'm um, talking about backups. One way, of course, is DD, which we just saw. It's like I want to copy everything exactly as is to a snapshot of my system or my key or whatever. And then this will be when we restore it exactly as you left it. Um, that's probably not how we want to do it, because if I have a, I assume I have a 500 gigabyte SSD, and I want to back up that SSD with DD. It's very convenient, because if I, if I lose my SSD, just buy another one, DD the thing back, and then I have an exact copy. But if I just change one bit of these 500 gigabytes, 500 billions of bytes, I have to do all the way again. Everything has to be copied again, because DD is stupid. It doesn't know what, like the differences. That's called uh, incremental backup. Incremental means, means that only what has to be changed is backed up. But everything that has remained unchanged will just be left as is. So this is why rsync is a good idea. Um, rsync operates on a much higher level. Um, it will use files and folders instead of uh, bits, and it will copy those, but it's smart. Actually, it's very, very feature-rich. If you read the man page, um, you'll be able to see it's very long. Um, it can also it can preserve uh, properties of files like date and time. It can preserve uh, the owner of the file uh, and much, much more. And also, what's cool about it, um, two features. One is it can check uh, how, how newer is a file. Like, um, for example, if I have these 500 gigabytes full, and I only change one file, rsync will check all the 500 gigabytes really quick, and see this file has been modified since, and copy only that one. 
Now, maybe that is not quite as safe because imagine that, well, actually the, the way I use rsync, it checks the modification date. And if the modification date of the source is newer than the target, it will override it. Um, however, if, if I have some really weird situation where I don't change the modification date, even though I modified a file, rsync will, no, will not know about it. Now, there are other modes where rsync can operate, which you could use instead. So um, this is incremental backup. Do you want to do incremental backup or start from scratch all the time? You get a massive speed up with incremental, but for some very special situations, you might need uh, a total backup. Another thing, another question that you have to ask yourself, is that data that I want to have sensible uh, and sensible, um, sensitive, like is it important to me uh, and private? And is that target where I'm saving to something that I don't want that people, even if they access it, could read from it? Like, say, um, I'm saving to, to a server. I'm backupping onto a server that is not mine and I don't trust the owner. I should probably encrypt my data before I back it up. But then again, uh, there will be a hassle of retrieving that data. Imagine I just lose the password. Then that data will just be gone, you know? Um, again, where do I have to save to? External hard drives are certainly the fastest option, but you have to be physically present. You have to connect your hard drive, and if the hard drive breaks, you need to buy a new one. If your house burns down, probably the hard drive is on the side of the laptop, and your data is gone again. So where do I save to? One way is the hard drive. Um, the other one is an NAS. That is called a Network Attached Storage. This is a server that saves data. Uh, so it's just a machine running somewhere, it's running all the time, and all it does, it takes data and distributes data again. So it's like a, a network hard drive. Um, that would be one way to do it, much slower usually than an external hard drive, because you have to go through, uh, through cables, and you need to have an, a real computer that actually runs that, uh, that server, that file server. Or you could even go on the internet. For example, those of you who are using, I don't know, Dropbox, uh, whenever they save something, Dropbox is going to upload it to the internet. And this is really slow, but really convenient because all the time your things got to just go out, right? But with an NAS under Linux, for example, um, when I save something, um, it's going not to Dropbox, it's going to my server at home, which is convenient because I'm the owner of that data and the, the process of sending it is encrypted. And so I don't have a hassle. And at the same time, I don't have to trust anybody like Dropbox. But again, here, the choice is yours. Now, what to backup is the last question about this. Your user files are under home your username. So uh, oh, by the way, these slides are online. So um, if you like to take notes, that's perfectly fine. If you're too lazy for that, you don't have to. Uh, if you go to thealternative.ch and you go to um, know how, you will already find all the slides that we have here. And if the recording succeeds, you will also find a recording. OK, um, so your files are here, including your user configuration. But the system-wide fi system files, they are somewhere else. Namely, here under slash etc, you'll find configuration. Here under opt or programs you installed manually or SEMA manually. Under boot, you will find everything that ne you need to boot. So for example, if you have a special boot configuration, it might, would have maybe made sense to back that up before you throw out your computer on through the windows or something like that. So always think, where, have I, where do I have data stored? I think that's about it for backups. Maybe I should turn that thing on before I use it. Yeah. OK, um, something convenient to you might be um, VPN. Who of you is from ETH Zurich? OK, so all of you have the right to access uh, your VPN. And probably most of you use that on, v on the Windows or Mac, installing an external program from uh, the ETH VPN website, then configuring that, and then having this really annoying button on the bottom right, which just tells you, hey, I'm ready to connect, and 99% of your time you don't use it. So why not just integrate it, that into your system? So there is a program called Open Connect, which is part of Network Manager. Um, yes, Network Manager is huge. Um, the package is weird because that network manager, something that I dislike about it is that it is written in capital letters at the beginning when you install the package, but not in all distributions and the commands sometimes are different too. So if network manager small doesn't work, try with capital N or capital M or both. Um, and here, um, the plugin for network manager is called Open Connect. This is what is able to connect your ETH. So let's do a little live demo. 
again this wonderful screensaver. So again, I can search for Open Connect, and you will see that it finds it immediately. And that's it. So I think this is a little bit faster than going to the ETH website. Now, Network Manager is able to handle your VPN connection. If you go down onto that Network Manager, you can go to VPN Connections, and there, Configure VPN. And then you can say, Add. What type do you want? And now, after you have installed this plugin, you will see Open Connect here in the very bottom. So you can click that, Create. And now this looks scary. So two things you have to change. One is the connection name, whatever you want to show up in the bottom. I usually call it ETH. And then the gateway is sslvpn.ethz.ch. That's it. You don't need to enter anything else. You don't need to check any other tab. So just save. And now when you go down to the bottom, VPN connections, ETH is here. And there you can type in. Sometimes you have to click connect depending on the distro. You type in your credentials. You can save the passwords if you want to. Press enter, and that's it. I'm on the VPN of ETH Zurich. And this works on any distribution that I know. Just install Open Connect uh, if, if you have Network Manager, of course. <coughs> well, um, there's another little tool, YouTube DL. <coughs> so what this does is it downloads YouTube videos. Um, sounds a little bit weird to download YouTube videos in a console. Actually, um, you're going to see after I do, when I do the demo, um, why this can be very useful. So let's take YouTube videos. Like This is an open source video that we can just use. Okay. So there's a link on top. I can just copy that link and then I open up the terminal and I go YouTube DL. And then the, there are two options which are interesting. You will find many more in the man page, as always. Capital F means list me all the formats. And I would highly recommend that you put your YouTube video in, uh, in brackets. Now it's downloading the web page. And oh, well, my console. <laughs> let, me, let me show this on a, on a smaller console. I hope you can read it. Uh, this is fish. You see it already autocompletes with uh, sensible things. Okay, this is what it looks like uh, if the resolution is a little bit higher. Um, you will see several things. One is that here you have only audio, and the other one is that some of them are labeled with best. So if you want the best video quality, you go with Format 22, which is in this case uh, HD ready. And there are several audios that you can download. For example, here this one is the one with the highest uh, sampling resolution. And you see here, this is an 18 megabyte file. So if you're looking for music online on YouTube and you want to download that, most of you probably have gone through an external website like youtubemp3.org or things like that. Um, you don't need that. Uh, you can just use YouTube DL. And all you say, let's say, let's assume this is a music video. I can say little f and then uh, check this is probably the audio that I want. So that will be 141. That's it. There it downloads my video and you see three, two, one and the download is completed. And now I have a file called bigbugbunny.m4a uh, in my current directory. Which is which is rather handy. And I'm not gonna re not gonna remove that because I don't really need it. Um again tab competition comes in handy with that. Um you see auto it automatically escaped my spaces like we learned yesterday. So I'm gonna just remove that, delete it, um I'm done with that. That's YouTube DL. Uh, another cool program is Rigel, um, or Regal, whatever you want to call it. If you have a DLNA capable TV, um, you can install this program, say what to share, turn it on, and then um, here, this is my wireless interface. I just say I want to share it over that. And then my TV will see my laptop as a network storage, and then it, you can just play immediately from your laptop streaming over wireless need to have a good wireless connection for that, else go wired. The higher the resolution is, of course, the more important it is that you have performance. 
Okay, um, so next thing I'm going to show you is mPlayer. mPlayer is a simple but yet really sophisticated program. Um, it's a video player. Now, unlike most video players that you probably know, it doesn't have a graphic user interface. Well, it can have, but by default it doesn't. And this is why I like it so much. Because, you know, like with VLC or all these programs, you are, you're looking for a spot in that movie that you watched like two weeks ago. And you have to click a hundred times until you really find it. Now, what if there was a keyboard shortcut for any operation that you could do? And uh, actually, you're much faster if you do it like that. So, um, here I have this Big Buck Bunny video downloaded. And I have set this to open with mPlayer. Of course, you can use the, the console to start it. This is what mPlayer looks like. It's just a window. And there are several keystrokes, for example, F for full screen, space for pausing, and you can navigate with your arrow keys a little bit with the small arrow keys, or with the uh, with up and down you can uh, you can navigate more. And uh, this is actually much faster than it's very responsive. It's much faster than what you're probably used to. You just have to remember this, the keyboard stroke shortcuts. Um, now, really, one really nice feature is you can speed up the video, or you can slow it down. And if there is an audio uh, delay, like if the video and the audio do not fit each other, then there's plus and minus. And with that, let's just put the speed back. With that, you can add or subtract delay with just one press of a button. So that's a really nice feature if you if you have downloaded some uh, some video with bad uh, badly converted content. Um, also, Amplayer is extremely stable like robust and if the video is really crappy it still will not crash. Uh, it's, I, I think I saw it crash once whereas VLC and so on they crash uh, very often when, when there's bad video content. So try out mPlayer, uh, it's, a, it's a fun program. Um, it doesn't have any playlists though, no playlist feature. Um, you will have to use um, MPV or, or some program like that in order to have playlists. Also there's a, when you open it a console you can add a flag this AF scale tempo filter. It's basically an audio filter. Uh, this will allow you to, like there's this quirrel effect when you speed up the video, you know, when you're talking like and this prevents the, the audio filter. So I have this one professor and he's like really talking slow. You all know him. You all have that one professor, right? Okay, most of them. Anyway, you can speed up, if you have podcasts, you can speed up the video speed uh, using that. And he will just talk like this all the time, and then you can learn much faster, okay? <laughs> now let's talk about PDFs. Some professors have this really nice feature, or let's call it a bug, to hand out PDFs separately all the time. So you have, at the end of the year, you have 30, 40 PDFs, chapter one, part one dot PDF, and so on, and so on, and so on. We want to merge all these into one document so that you can efficiently search with your favorite PDF weaver, control F and search and not open all the 30 one after the other one. Now luckily there is PDF Unite. It's one of a hundred programs you can do the job. Um, this is, it's so simple that's why I'm showing it to you, but there are many others. So PDF Unite works as follows. PDF Unite, sources, and the last thing, the last PDF you enter is one that should not exist yet, it's the destination. For example, PDF Unite, exercise.pdf, appendix.pdf, combo.pdf. It's going to read from exercise and appendix and overwrite or create combo.pdf with a, this, everything that it finds in there, and then after the last page of that, the first page of that, everything it finds there. And of course, what you learned yesterday, be efficient, you can use asterisks. So imagine that your professor names course, part, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever. You put a star, it will be substituted by any character there is uh, in alphabetical order, and then all this will be merged. So with a single command, you can, add, if you have 200, uh, 200 PDFs here, and each of them has two pages, so one second, and there's going to be a merged PDF showing up. The other way around is PDF separate, which is a, a nice program too. I don't think you can go uh, zipper in PDF merge, zipper in PDF separate, because it's, they're part of a larger package. But there is the, the command not found command, CNF, um, I don't know, maybe it even works. And um, I use it on my list. I never tested it on, on SUSE. So let's see, CNF, uh, CF, PDF. Yeah, there we go. Um, Popper Tools, which is installed on your system. Okay, so um, PDF Unite should already exist on, on that system.
So CNF is command not found PDF Unite and OpenSUSE will tell you what you have to install to get a specific command. Okay, so PDF separate works like PDF Unite reversed. And this time you have, of course, one input file and several output files. But now the problem is that you cannot specify an arbitrary number of output files because there has to be exactly as many output files as there are pages in the input file. This is why the syntax is slightly different here. Actually, you have to insert a percent %d, and this will be substituted by a number. So if you have two images, two uh, pages on images.pdf, and you go that, then there will be created two PDFs called image1.pdf and image2.pdf. And uh, those are really trivial programs. And you can put that percent %d wherever you want, of course. Okay, now, um, CU power consumption. Um, this laptop is really power hungry. Um, there are huge differences. So there is power top. Um, let me see, maybe I can show you live demo. So for power top, you have to, go, you have to be sudo. And only if I unplug the power of my laptop, actually the battery will be discharged and power top can measure uh, the rate of discharge. And you see that my laptop right now is consuming 36 watt. That is huge, and I have about one and a half hours of battery to go. So that is really bad. Most of your computers probably show something between 5 and 10 watt. I saw one that consumed 2 and a half watt. And with that, of course, you can go on for hours and hours and hours. There you can see, actually, how fast your laptop is discharging. So let me plug it in really quick before it dies. Now, PowerTop can do much more. You see, um, here is a tab in order to navigate, ask for exit, and there is R that you can press to, to refresh. doesn't fit on a page. So idle stats is not interesting. Frequency stats, that is a fun thing. Um, actually, if you refresh that a lot, you get shorter messages. So you see every processor on my system has, every core on my system has its own page. And then there is the package, which shows all together. So. I see that, for example, the 2.4 gigahertz were used 1% of the time since my last refresh. And that way, the higher values I get, the more the processor has to work, the faster it runs. It's called dynamic power management. If the processor is idle, the clock speed will be reduced. It works much slower. And that way, it doesn't get as hot. That is why um, how, you, how your processor saves power. And if it's used a lot, you will see high voltages here. Um, for example, 3.6, so we had uh, uh, something that caused the processor to run really fast for a little bit. Um, however, on your laptops, you're probably, no, your laptop is not cool enough. Uh, it's always the problem with laptops. The, the air ventilation is not strong enough to cool down the processor. So if you have a strong processor, it gets too hot. And for example, with my laptop, when it reaches 100 degrees, it just stops working and then keeps working again, and then gets too hot again, stops working in that several dozen or hundred times per second. Um, so you will see that uh, in the beginning, you will see really high values when you go convert a big video or something. You see really high values, and then suddenly, your laptop starts blowing air like crazy, and then all this drops. And then you know, oh, well, cooling is the problem. The laptop would be faster if you threw it into water, or probably not. And then you have some device stats, so it tells you how, what's the, what's the, um, the power that each device does. For example, my radio is a uh, radio device, you see here Wi-Fi, uh, it's going at 100%, there's no power, uh, power saving mode, it, it's firing Wi-Fi as much as it can. Bluetooth, same thing, I have nothing optimized on my laptop, um, I did that because I know that it doesn't help problem is the graphics card. Um, here is Tutables, that's the last tab. Um, it says bad, 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 but if you put that, if you, you can, you can uh, hit enter and it will modify something in your system to try to save power. And you can play around with these values. If something stops working, change it back. And also there is, uh, PowerTop does have a, an auto-tune uh, calibration uh, facility. Um, Basically, you fully charge your laptop, then you remove the, uh, you move everything there is, and you tell PowerTop to calibrate itself. And what's going to do? It's going to put the screen dark. It's going to put the screen full, uh, half, etc. Uh, plays around with Wi-Fi, turns on Bluetooth, turns it off, 
checks all the parameters and then tries to figure out how much battery time you have, how healthy your battery is, and what would be good for your laptop in order to save power. So it's a, it's a really interesting program. Now, um, if you like that CPU porn that I just showed to you, there's CPU power, it shows you even more detail. But not going to go into that. Okay, now, now, comes the, now comes the cool part. Okay, this is an SD card, right? And what I did, I accidentally deleted all the pictures from it. Or anything, anything interesting like documents, uh, etc., etc. I want to recover these files. I've deleted them with RM, okay? So they are gone forever. But wait, there are recovery programs. NSA can restore your, your files even on a deleted hard drive, right? Why does only NSA have to be able to do that? Well, how about I just teach you how to do it yourself? So there's Photorec. This is, in my opinion, the most powerful free software recovery tool that I know. There are only over 300, not file types, but file families supported. It tr can recover bare text files, Word documents, ODTs, uh, music videos, pictures, pretty much anything. I don't, I've never seen anything that that, that can't do. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this SD card and go from the first byte to the very last byte all the way through and trying to recover all the data that I can get. Now, how think do you, who, who thinks this SD card, I, I want to make it small, so because if it's like an 8 gigabyte SD card, it will take a while to get through. Who thinks this SD card is larger than 4 gigs? Okay, larger than 2, larger than 1, larger than 500 megs. Lower than 500 megs? How much? 16 megabyte. This thing is prehistorical. And it was free back at the time already. So I'm going to plug it in. And hope that it's going to work. So LSBLK. Show me all the, the, all the things that I have on my computer. So this is my main hard drive with uh, all the crap that you don't need to know about. But here is my SD card, MMC BLK0. And it has one partition, which is that one. So I'm going to go sudo photorec. Um, please enlarge the terminal. OK, will do. So let me get a different terminal. So there you go. OK, it tells me what do you want to, to recover. and. What I probably want to recover is, uh, where is it? Um, there it is, MMCBLK0, 14 megs formatted, and I want to process that. So um, it asks me first, what is the partition type of, uh, of your disk? Now, um, FAT, uh, I, I say I want no, well, I can, which partition do you want? Actually, there are several scenarios which, uh, which can go wrong. For example, if you have deleted, by, if DD, the first bit, the first bytes of your device, your partition table is gone, and it's not even recognized as a partition anymore. So there you just go, no partition, whole disk. Uh, it will try to recover things from where your computer doesn't even see partitions anymore. And it's able to do that. That's really scary. If you format your hard drive, doesn't matter. Photorec will find it. Okay, so I'm probably going to say I want just this partition. doesn't matter. Um, there's one thing I have to tell you. Everything that is in the file formatting is gone. So, you know, basically, how to say that? File names, last modified date, directory structures, hierarchy, it's all gone. Okay. So um, I say I want that. And then it tells me what, what file system is it? What do you think? various file system. For Linux, usually we use X2 or X3. Now I know this is definitely not one of those, so I go other. And I want the whole partition. I want any files that you can recover. Not only the, the files that have been freed, like the files that have been deleted, but everything. And so now where do I want to save to? Let's put this to, let's say, downloads. And then uh, what should I press? See when the destination is correct. No, let's create a new. So downloads blah. That, I think that will be good. So we'll go one up again and refresh uh, downloads. There should be for blah, and I want to extract in there. Okay. So uh, what? See. See when the destination is correct. <coughs> and there it goes. And it's done. That's why I use such a small SD card. This can take hours if you have a larger thing. So now let's have a look at what, what we got. 
So there's recap deer one, and we'll create many more deers if it runs out of space. And then um, we have some report.xml, which actually tells us what it found out. You can, I think you can watch that in a, in a browser. It would be more readable. Right, and there's some there are errors that it found. It tells you more or less what it, uh, what it did. OK, um, so what did we find? Some pictures from the introduction to free software course. Mm -hmm, that's fine. Logo, oh wait, what is that? Wait, these are pictures from my childhood. Um, I prepared now because I did it once, but I have to say I had no clue there was any data on that. And so these are like 10 year old pictures or even older ones from my very first camera that when I just got it, did with that SD card before buying a larger one. That was the SD card that came with that camera. Photorec got it back 10 years later. Okay, so what is going to happen if you use Photorec on your uh, on your own PC. Several things that you have to know. First of all, don't ever use Photorec um, to, like, when you read from a disk, don't write to that disk. Because what you're looking for is for free sectors. When you delete a whole bunch of files, they will just be marked as free, and you do not want to overwrite that. So it's very important that you don't write onto that disk, but instead, um, you just read it and you put it to an external hard drive. That's important. Don't write to a disk where you want to recover stuff from. The other thing is, be ready for anything. I mean, your browser will create files you don't even know about, and it will delete them afterwards, but Photorec especially is especially well at recovering deleted files, right? So, you know, everybody has their little secrets, and Photorec is good at getting them out. And uh, I have used Photorec on people before. They have always asked me to do so. And I have to say, it is really surprising what comes out. And I will not tell you any details about this stuff. Is there a question? Uh, yes. um, is the external information still in the picture? So you know when it was taken? Yes, um, all the metadata stays in the pictures, because that is part of the file. And Photorec will recover this data, too. <laughs> yes, but not the file names or any file information, which is not in the file. OK. Yeah. So when you use Photorec on someone else, please be responsible. Then there's DDRISQ. Now imagine you have a hard drive. This time it's not you deleted something from it, but it's broken. Hard drive is really almost broken. When you read it, you know, everything gets really, really slow. The BIOS, the computer doesn't want to start from it anymore, and it does really weird noises and stuff like that. Uh, you love that hard drive. No, probably not, but you love the data that is on that hard drive, and you were stupid. You did not make a backup. Hey, by the way, a hard drive can fail at any moment, no matter how new it is, how many how important it is, no many, no matter how many francs it costs, doesn't matter. Uh, hard drive can any hard drive can fail at any instance. So always have a backup, no matter what. Now imagine you don't have a backup, like pros, most of you probably do not sometimes. There's DDRISQ. So imagine this hard drive is almost failing, but still more or less working. But there are some blocks which are damaged, causing anybody who wants to access that hard drive to crash. That is a situation which is second worst you can have. The worst is it's not even recognized anymore. Hard drive is dead. Actually, my, my uh, flatmate Mickey, sometimes you see him put hard drives in a freezer. And then they will, if they are cold, um, they will be able to run for like an hour and then die. And so within that hour, he has to get the data out of the hard drive. So there's DD DDRISQ. DDRISQ is like DD, but it's specialized for, specialized for weird things. So it doesn't care what's happening. All it does is it reads, and if it can't read, it puts a zero. And so if some blocks are really dead on the hard drive, the, the, these blocks will be gone. They will just be substituted by zero. But all the data that's around it will be copied. And so, oh, by the way, if you have a broken hard drive, don't shake it, don't move it, don't write to it, and read as few as possible to it. it ideally, read exactly every sector once with DDRISQ so that you copy that data to a safe place. It's like a ship that is going to sink. Any access that you do will weaken the hard drive even more. Okay? And so DDRISQ, you pull ashore all the data that you can, and then you can throw away the hard drive. All right? And that's really nice. Uh, it once saved my life, I have to say. Okay, now let's talk about something still quite exciting, but not as dangerous anymore. 
So there's XRender. XRender is a program that configures your, your screens, and it can do that job really well. Um, for example, if you want, if I have this projector connected to my laptop, I told my system where to put the projector, and I told it to clone the screen. So I have the same thing here as I have there. And that, hmm, okay. And that I have done using XRender. So usually you have probably have this graphical user interface where you drag your screens along. In the end, most of them call XRender. And so when you call XRender without any arguments, um, it shows several things. First of all, it shows me here LVDS is the internal laptop screen, can have the following resolutions. It should be there, and it is there. It's because the projector, which is below, only has this resolution is maximal. It should be there, and it, uh, it should be there, and it is there. So um, when, it, when I use that to clone, it will automatically select the lowest common resolution of those screens. Um, and I see that I have three other displays that I could connect to my graphics cards, which are all disconnected. Uh, this is when you uh, call XRender without any arguments. Now we can use these two LVDS and VGA0, which is LVDS internal, VGA0. The, uh, the project, um, we can use those to to tell XRender what to do with them. So I say XRender dash dash output, and then I say what output there is and what I want to do with it. For example, I can say the projector, I want it to have it auto. So that is, it takes the highest possible resolution or the recommended resolution and automatically sets it to that. So it's one command to enlarge the beamer, uh, the projector as possible. Also, if, uh, if I have an external screen, uh, which is sitting on the left of my laptop, I can say, well, I don't want to duplicate the screen. I want to be able to move my mouse to the left, and then it's going to be my left screen to the to the right. It's going to be a right screen. So I say VGA0. I want it as high scale, as well scale as possible, and I want it left of my internal screen. Um, what I have currently is this. VGA0, same as LVDS, and then that's why both are the same. And of course, you can rotate. Also, it can do many more things. You can, uh, you can change gamma, like the contrast. We had a projector which uh, had a way too bright resolution. We were unable to configure it on that interface because ETA doesn't let us. So just use XRender, put the gamma down, and the contrast gets much stronger, and then suddenly it works. Uh, or you can rotate things. For example, I have a setting uh, when I rotate my laptop. Well, I can't do it because I'm connected, but you can put it like this. It looks really weird, I know, but I don't care because it's really handy to read you know, books on a, on a laptop screen because they are that way. So everybody will be looking at you if you do that, but hey, who cares? <laughs> okay, of course you can do a script and you can use keyboard shortcuts. So of course I didn't type in that command when I turned on my computer. Instead I have a script that a really cool guy dev developed on the internet. He put it on, I told him, hey, I mean, this doesn't work on my system. How about this line to, uh, to auto-detect screens, no matter what I connect, if it's uh, DVI or HDMI or VGA. They're always called differently, but now it's just searching for a term connected and assuming this is the external screen. And he thought that was a good idea. He worked on that, integrated it. So now we have this script, plug in the computer, and I press one button, which calls that script with the corresponding command, and it will automatically set up the project. It goes really, really fast. Uh, that, is, that is one thing why, uh, why I love XRender, even though its syntax is a little bit complicated. But once you put it to keys, it gets incredibly easy. OK, talking about scripts. So here again, crunch, bang, bing, bash. That means, hey, this is a bash script written in bash, which you should all know by now. And this is actually, again, something from my friend Aline. And she is someone who likes to watch movies, but she's a lazy person like everybody of us is, so she will certainly not want to turn off her screens by hand and take the remote and turn on the, 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 the TV, etc. So she made a script for it. So what does it do? And this is really how she does it. First of all, it turns off the computer external screen and the internal screen of her laptop. Then it will turn off the screensaver setting, because when she watches a movie, she doesn't want a screensaver to come. After that, she defines the TV as her main output, puts it on the right resolution that she wants. After that, there, oh, there's a protocol. You know HDMI, the connector? Like this one. There is not only picture that travels through that cable, there's also a protocol called CEC, and that allows devices to talk to each other. 
So the cool thing with that is you can tell the TV to turn itself on using HDMI. And that's what that does. So she doesn't take the remote to turn on her, her TV. Her TV starts at the moment that she tells her laptop that she wants it to start. Also, it works the other way. So with her TV remote, now she controls her laptop. And if she presses pause on the TV remote, the TV just forwards that to the laptop, and the laptop will press space, and then pause. It, the video will just pause. Um, I did that with, uh, with an overhead projector that I got used, and it's, it's great. CC is really cool. It's really hacky, but it works most of the time. <laughs> and then, of course, Olin is a graphical person, so she sets a random wallpaper on the TV so that it looks nice before she starts um, the video that she wants. Okay. Another thing is this one. This is one of my worst scripts that I've ever done in my life. I don't understand what's going on there, but it works. This is something I copy-pasted from the internet, put it together. It's like a Frankenstein monster. It looks like it, too. So this is what it does. It scans for pictures which are in a format that the TV of my father does not support. Because even though this wonderful TV, smart TV, so smart, has support for JPEG, it doesn't have support for some JPEGs. So it scans all the JPEGs. Uh, it looks for those, and then it sees those who are not supported, converts them into supported format. And my father has, I don't know how many, 10,000s or even 100,000s of pictures, family photos, old dias, etc., etc. It's, it's a nightmare. I mean, you put this through once, and you're done within, I, I think it took like 15 minutes over network. So that was, that was kind of cool. And now all the pictures are supported by the TV. Um, no, you don't have to understand that. It's just, you know, you, you have this idea in mind. You know, I want to go somewhere there. You Google your way through. You copy paste it. It somehow works and you forget about it and don't ever open that again, okay? But you can do it. That's, that's aggressive hacking, like worst possible hacking that you can do. And Bash is good for that. Okay, now um, custom shortcuts. Anything you can script, you can shortcut. Um, so. There's a custom screen capture with import, which is part of the Image Magix program. Image Magix can do anything with images. That's why it's called Image Magix. And um, import does a screen shot. Now, if you just go import, you can select, drag, and drop the way you want to have. But you can also, of course, uh, take the entire screen, the current window, both screens, an external screen, whatever. And then you can name that using for example, a regular expression, or you say, I want the current date to be in the name, and then place that into some folder of your computer, or put it into the clipboard, or whatever. Um, so, of course, you're going to associate that with a keystroke, and that way, any kind of screenshot that you want to take, well, only the ones that you want to take, will be associated with a, with a key combination. Another thing is you can master your music easily with the keyboard as well. So there's, for example, Clementine, uh, which is my favorite music player. It's not in the console for once. So I have this, com um, watch it on the bottom right. I have my keystroke, and up, there's this symbol which just appeared, which is Clementine. If I do it again, it pops up, and then I can uh, start to, to play my favorite music. I can close that window, and now I can pause the music, I can keep going to the next one, etc. Just quit it, whatever I want, um, with the keyboard. And that, of course, you can use, do using commands. Another thing is there's a program called Light. Uh, Light works like this. Uh, there's no oh no Light. Yeah, if you go with H, it will give you help. Um, this is screen brightness, and uh, you can get or set the value. So, for example, I can go Light set to one, and now my screen is really dark. And if I go to 100. It gets really bright. Of course, this does not affect the the projector, but you might have seen that uh, the reflection of the screen on me got got a little darker. Um, this way, uh, I don't have to increase or decrease screen uh, screen brightness. Like, you know, these five percent that are subtracted or added all the time, you have to press the uh, twenty times until you get it really dark. Um, you just using light, for example, you have these absolute values. I have three settings. Really dark, almost dark, and really bright. I don't need anything else ever. And the same thing with PA mixer for volume. I mean, for every uh, ear earplug that you have, you have your favorite setting because, of course, you have used some easy MP3 gain to normalize your music. So all the music plays at the same volume. So all you need to do is adjust the volume to your headphone. So you plug in your headphone. And you listen, and once you have found, OK, this headphone is at 23%, you create a, a keyboard shortcut that calls PA Mixer with the setter 
23%, and you remember that. So plug in your favorite headset, press a key command, and that's it. You don't even have to, carry it, to worry about, uh, about that anymore. Okay, now let's go a little bit more advanced. All this stuff you can do, just Google it, and that's it. It's, it's trivial. I mean, well, okay, now let's talk about remote machine control, a very powerful thing that you can do. Um, it's SSH is the command where you can go into another running machine. And actually what it's going to do, it's going to put your terminal into that other machine. Okay, it's really remote control. Uh, computer scientists, you can use uh, optimus.ethz.ch. So the syntax is always SSH, username, at computer. And this will open up for you a shell on your username on an ETH Linux computer. This is only for computer scientists of ETH, of course. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show a live demo later on. SCP is like CP, but instead of copying a file locally, it will copy it to a remote machine. And so what it does is SCP source file, and then again, username at machine. Here it's an IP address. There it is a machine name. I mean, whatever you prefer. Then column, and then the absolute path. And so this means copy my file.pdf into the ETH folder at the machine located at that IP. And then you prompt me for password and just copy there. And of course, there's rsync. As I told you, it's powerful. Um, with that syntax, you can use rsync to go over the internet as well. And you can, uh, this, all this S means secure. It's encrypted. So all the traffic that you have to your machine is secured. Um, Maybe some of you still know Telnet. Telnet is what came before SSH. Okay, now I'm going to do a live demo. So, um, you know that network attached storage thing? I have one at the house of my parents. Um, it's, it's a WD MyBook Live, so I don't want to do advertising for that, but just so you get a, an idea what it looks like. Um, I think that will probably be a neat picture. So, it's really... It really looks like a hard drive, but it's actually a little computer. So instead of a USB plug here, it has an Ethernet plug, and here there is power. It does not have any screens attached to it, but hey, it runs Linux. Actually, more precisely, it runs Debian Linux. And so what you can do is you can configure that. Now, unfortunately, WD, they have a lot of software and that thing which is proprietary, which I don't like. It doesn't work that well. I want to have this my system. Now, there's a really nice guy who wrote... Uh, a guide on how to flash that onto a proper Debian, like bare bones, like exactly as if you had your USB key plugged into your laptop from a running device. And you don't even have to disassemble it. Of course, I disassembled it and then read you don't have to disassemble it. But anyway, so if you have one of these machines, you can easily flash that. And that is the case also for Synology, NASA's, I believe, um, they have that too. So uh, I'm now going to do uh, a demo where I'm going to use my laptop and I'm going to open a shell through the internet, through the routers of ETH, the internet, and the router at home, to go to that NAS. I don't want you to see that, so I'm going to turn the screen off, because uh, I don't want you to know my IP. Okay, so what I did is SSH, and then just, you know, username, add machine name. And what I get is that. And looks like a totally ordinary console, except for the host name. Um, of course, you need uh, you see here why why the host name uh, is very important. That's why it shows it all the time. Okay, so um, what I can do now is uh, I don't have sudo there. I have su. I never cared about sudo. I think that should have been answered right now. I'm root. Now I can do. This is a Debian system, so of course the package manager is Debian. And there, it's actually this little device that you saw in the picture being 200 kilometers away, searching for updates. That's, that's how it works. That is why SSH is such a great thing. And, you, you know, and this is really a server, which is that small. And it's running totally ordinary Linux. Do whatever you want with that. You can install Nano if you want to. Uh, I did install Nano. <laughs> okay, um, so um, if you want to check the health of your server, since it doesn't have a screen, how do you do that? Well, you SSH into it, and uh, then you check uh, the syslog, for example. This will tell you messages about the system. For example, when I checked this morning, it told me, hey, I'm out of space, and really it is running out of space, so I have to clear that out. So how do you do that over oh, the console? There is no screen. That is why I think it's very important for you to know the console, because once you go that advanced, it's not that advanced, actually, but already here, without the console, you cannot do anything. 
Um, and there is, for example, Mediatom, which is a service that uh, it's like the Rigel, but more advanced. That's a DLNA server. Uh, just go var log Mediatom, and I find my, my logs there. And there, for example, it told me, hey, everything is going well. So I'm happy with that. OK, now let's um, do something even weirder. Now that I have, uh, have established the connection from my laptop to the NAS, I want to go from the NAS, SSH into the router at home. So laptop tells the NAS to tell the router at home. Okay? And guess what? The router is running, what do you think? Yeah. Linux. Yeah, I see you, you understand it now. So. OK, um, let's get out of here. So I am still at, at my book live. Okay? So go SSH. Uh, I think I can do it with root. I can only do that from within the network at home. It has been disabled from the internet, but I am in the network, right? I'm in my NAS, so so it's uh, the usual stuff. I will disable password login after this course, so don't try to hack me, please. <laughs> so it should reply. There we go. And there we are. So this is my router responding. OK, so um, this might seem a little weird. Open via OpenWRT is the distribution of Linux that is on that router. It's super small. Um, but basically, it's, it's Linux, and most of the commands you know work as well. It even has a little package manager. So this is the version of that thing. And every time you log in into that, it will give you a recipe. And every time you upgrade your system, it's a different recipe. That's the day those guys decided to do it. Of course, you can remove it. And I can look around. And there's a to-do that I put. And if I go, if I want to look at it, I see, oh, wait, there is my to-do list. It's a dummy to-do list um, that, uh, that I wrote. And this is actually located on a router, a totally ordinary router back at home. Okay? So you see, you see probably now what, what is the power that you get if you understand the Linux console. Okay? So now I log out of the router. Oh, I'm back in my NAS. See, it changed. Log out of my NAS, and whoop, I'm again on my laptop. OK, so um, CRUD is something magic, too. You remember, probably, if you have ever broken your Windows boot, if you're going to repair it, you're going to use this. You plug in your disk or your USB key, you boot from it, you press Next, and you hope that everything goes well. You pray, you pray, it does noise, and eventually it will either say, hey, I succeeded, or hey, I failed. And if it succeeded, then you still pray, and maybe it has worked, maybe it hasn't. So Typically, it will tell you, I did not find any problem. Everything is working fine, and nothing is working. So I got to hate these a lot. Um, this is what I prefer. Even though it's much more complicated, you, do, you decide what you do. It's not some magic black box that does something you don't know what it does. This is actually how you get into your system without booting it. And that you can do with any unencrypted hard drive. And the encrypted hard drive, you first enter the key for decrypting it, then mount it, and then you can do that as well. So if you, if you lost your root password or any password, if you lost all the passwords on your computer and it's not encrypted, then this way you can reset the passwords. The only way to protect yourself against physical access to your computer is by encrypting it. That's important. OK, so what do we do? By the way, this is the same thing with any operating system. So what we do is we take an OpenSUSE uh, install DVD or a key containing that, now that you know how to DD that onto a USB key. We log in as root. That is, under OpenSUSE, that's important. It asks you what you want to log in. You go, what the? I mean, just go type root and enter. It will not ask you for password. Then you're in. And you're in the login shell on, a, on, a, on an operating system that only runs in your memory and that doesn't re read or write anything to the disk. So what you have to do now is, now that you are in this world, protected world that will be completely deleted at your next reboot, you need to somehow go down to your actual physical hard disk, attach to that system, and then work in that. And first of all, you have to mount it, like we learned yesterday. So if you have an LVM-based system, uh, that you know, LSBLK will show you what to do. And you mount either that, if you have LVS, or this. And then, of course, you adjust your, uh, your hard drive number. Typically, it's not one into anything you like, typically M and T. And then you have to do this. This is basically tie the system a little better to your console. And then you have this system mounted well enough so you can enter it. 
and there's this last command, chroot mnt. This will enter your system. It, will, it has never been started. The system has never been started, but you are in it as if it was loaded. Now, actually, it's going to use the Linux kernel. Uh, well, OK, may be wrong. Um, it's going to use the sys parts of the system that you have on your, on your disk and then execute the commands actually on the hard drive. Okay, maybe that, maybe that didn't make much sense that I just said. I don't really understand how it works. It's the magic to me. But then you have a shell, like a console, on your system which is broken. Even if it sounds like magic, it's really like that. And then you should just, you know, just reinstall the bootloader, uh, fix the files that you accidentally renamed or broke or whatever. That's how you can repair your Linux system. Okay, another thing are cron jobs. Okay, this is not very interesting. Um, you know, tasks under Windows. Just run this once a day, run this at every reboot, etc. Under Linux, these are called cron jobs. And if you want to know more about it, go man cron tap. And there's everything in there. Or you, you go in a wiki and, and look it up. It's fairly trivial. Okay, now we're going to talk about development. Who of you is, uh, will be doing or is doing already some programming or C and so on? Quite a few, okay. So um, there's probably GCC, which you might know uh, from your early programming days. Maybe not. So computer scientists, you will be using that program. Who, who, how many of you develop um, C on a Windows machine? One. Okay. <laughs> so, so that's kind of missing the point. Um, basically, if you want to do that on Windows, you have to have a compiler which is called Mingv. Uh, whatever you pronounce that. Choose your, choose your favorite pronunciation. And this is a, it's a kind of a hassle, according to me. I like, I like this approach a little bit better. So what we do is, first of all, I'm going to create a file. Uh, well, let's go to, yeah. No, let's go to downloads, I think. And then blah and delete anything in it. So this is a dangerous command. <laughs> Watch it. <laughs> okay, so um, what you're going to do is um, create a little C program, and then uh, type all the includes. And return zero. This is this is a return value. When a program dies, it dies with zero, which means as a convention, hey, everything is nice. I could type anything I want. I'm a programmer. I decide. Okay, so save this out. And now I want to compile it. And under Windows, now what you have to do, either you use some development environment, and you you, you import this, and then you set up a project, and you compile it, or you use Mingva, so you open up the terminal, and you CD all the time, and you use brackets to get to escape all the spaces and I don't know what. On Linux, everything is integrated in your system. Remember, your package manager has installed for you GCC, so you use it. That's it. And my program is compiled. That's how fast it goes. So now I have two files, one being an executable, a.out, the other one being what I had before. And if I run a.out with the dot slash, like we learned yesterday, it says hello world. And it returns with status zero. So that is probably kind of handy uh, for those who will program C, including anybody doing CASP in third semester. So all the computer science students of ETH Zurich will be using GCC in third semester. And if you also in CASP, you will probably need to no, you will need to decompile like that bomb lab, which is really cool. Uh, if you if you don't know what it is, you can look forward to that. And um, you have a bomb, and you need to check the machine code in order to get rid of the bomb. And if it explodes, it goes online and blames you for exploding the bomb. So it's really, it's really cool. I like Professor too. Um, there's GDB, which is the GNU debugger or something like that. And I can say I want to open this a.out, which is binary code. This is processor code, not machine level. I want to open that and I'll have a look in it. So what I can do now. There's several layouts. GDB is a world by itself. Um, You'll probably have to look a little bit. So this is the actual machine code uh, disassembled. 
So where they had ones and zeros, it tried to, to substitute things to make a little bit more sense. So this is, for example, take from the stack and push it onto processor register B. Uh, RB, RBP, no, RBP is the register base pointer. Right. And so on. So really low level, lowest level possible. Um, what you can do now is set the breakpoint somewhere there is main. Yeah, right. This is main. Um, this is actually written in the program that main starts here at this address in memory. So I can set a breakpoint here. Now you see it has a B plus, and that means when I run the program, it'll stop there. Now what I can do, so now right now it is here. What I can do is have a look a little bit more. And there on the top, and that's a really cool part, I see the registers. Um, now this console is really small, so it only shows the top registers. If you have a larger console with a more normal resolution than this huge and large one, so you can read it, you will see all the registers. And you can look with NI next instruction, you can look into what it does. And so every time, uh, well, some, sometimes the GUI is a little buggy, but every time something is happening, um, it will display that uh, on top, highlighted, uh, recolor things. Um, the console is too small, so it's kind of destroying itself. Um, usually, it works very well unless you really need need, need it right like right now. But GDB is extraordinarily powerful and it's free. And you will be using that at least in Casp and in compiler design. You will spend your entire life on that thing. It's very interesting, though. So. So you can debug any program, really any. There's, you know, if you don't have the source code, this is the only way to go. Okay, then let's talk a little bit about encryption. Um, you can have, I will distinguish two kinds of encryptions. There are more, of course. You can have a full disk encryption, which means your entire system will run on an encrypted hard drive. And we will have to decrypt anything there is. For example, my laptop is full disk encrypted. So whenever I start any program, it will have to decrypt it first and then load into memory. Um, speed impact none, because the processors have, modern processors have support for that. So it can decrypt on the fly and encrypt again. That's no problem. So if you want to have a full disk encrypted setup, um, you first have to erase the whole disk. Because else PhotoRec will just come and take your old data that you had before encrypting and make sense of that. So what you want instead is erase it completely. And that we do by overwriting physically the sectors. Uh, for example, you can go dd if equals dev0 and then of your hard drive that you want to erase. And it will write, if it's a 40 gigabyte hard drive, it will write 40 gigabytes of zeros, erasing all the content that was there before. So then your hard drive is really empty. For SSDs, there is a, there is a nicer command. And sometimes there are advanced commands, uh, SATA commands, etc., which can, uh, which are made for this, for shredding a device. We call that. It doesn't physically destroy the device; it just deletes all the data, really deletes it. Okay, so once this is done, once your disk is clean, or if you have just bought a brand new disk, you can start a crypt setup lux format that, uh, whatever, whatever your, like SDA, for example, if you want to uh, encrypt your primary hard drive. Uh, this is going to create a container for encryption, ask you for a password, and then everything you're going to put into that container will be encrypted and then placed there. And once you have that done, when you want to access it later, you go crypt set locks open, and then it will decrypt it and mount it like a regular um, device. Well, I think you have to mount it afterwards, uh, but it will, it will give you access to, the, to your device. That is one thing. Um, and then you have to, you know, booting from a full disk encrypted hard drive is much more complicated. Of course, so if you have any questions, just, I mean, we're here and we will be there. If you really want to encrypt things, I think you are thinking the same way as we are, and you should probably consider becoming a member. Because then we can learn from you and you will learn from us. Anyway, so another way is to go ENCFS. This is just creating an encrypted folder. So basically, this works like that you have this folder, and in a folder, there's just nonsense written until someone has the password. And then, with that password, you can mount the folder into somewhere else, a different folder. And then anything you open, anything you put into that folder will be actually be encrypted and then put in this folder. So that folder doesn't really exist, OK? So your encrypted, your hard drive will only see encrypted data. That's very important, because else folder can come and recover these, these files. There's nothing temporary except in your memory itself. But down on the hard drive, there's just this weird nonsense that makes absolutely no sense if you don't have the password. 
And so what we do is we have this uh, talk, the this, this syntax is as follows, ANCAFS, and oh, ANCAFS only supports absolute paths. Don't use relative paths on, on that. So we start, for example, with a tilde or with a slash. I specify the target here, which should be the container, the encrypted container with all the nonsense. And then here, the mount point, where I can mount it wherever I want to. And then whatever I'm going to place in there will be encrypted, put in there. Whatever I find here comes actually from there. And as soon as I say f user mount uh, dash u and then my mount point, this directory will be cleared and become empty again. There's no data in that. There has never been. This is actually just a link to NKFS, which will write it there. Okay? So this is how you open it. This is how you close it. Uh, live demo, we don't have a time for that. OK, so expert things. Um, most of you are probably using VirtualBox. Apparently, Virt Manager is better on well, my Arch machine. It um, doesn't work as I want it to, so I'm still using VirtualBox, as you probably saw. Um, but you know, people who are more competent than I am, they will, they will almost always use something more advanced, like Word Manager. Uh, for example, I think Mickey managed to hand his graphics card through, so he took the actual device and gave the entire physical device to his virtual machine. It's called PCI Pass-Through. Uh, and that way he can game on a virtual machine with the full speed of his uh, graphics card. It doesn't even have to install Windows natively. So many weird things you can do. This is expert stuff. OK, managing hardware your way. Um, I pointed out a little bit yesterday, like uh, Lucas, uh, is he here? I don't think he's here. OK, anyway, so Lucas, who is a member of us, he thought, well, you know, that sensor thing that I have for recognizing brightness, ambient brightness, it's not working the way I want. I want my own formula for calculating what screen brightness should be compared to the actual brightness. So he wrote a script. Um, you can see it here. So he's taking this, he's reading out the data, running it through some really complicated mathematical formula with polynomes and so on that he developed on his own. And then he writes the actual value to the screen brightness. And that way his laptop adjusts it exactly the way he wants. Um, you can create a web server. You can create a web server on your own laptop, which is good if, you have, if you're a web developer. You probably don't want to be online all the time. And if you are able to set up a web server on your laptop, you know, the big fat servers, they run Linux as well. So once you have learned how to do that, I mean, you just do the exact same thing on a big server. But, 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 your laptop is nice, small, and protected, and you're just the only one using it, so that's fine. If you go on a big fat web server, it's going to be several billions of people who can try to hack that thing. And um, many of them will. And so you have to care about security even more if you're working on an actual server. So this is why this is something really advanced. Even though there are so many guides around there, how easy it is to do that, in order to make it safe, you need to have experience or you need to have friends. And then once you have your web server running on the current machine, you just go to HTTP localhost, and this means my own machine right now, and then you have your website on your own machine, okay? So before you go, let's do a few little things. First of all, I will just recapitulate um, what you have seen. We have, you've been here, the ones that have been here longest have been only three courses here. And in the beginning, most of you probably didn't even know what Linux is. So right now you are, I think, so much further than you were in the beginning. And this is just the beginning for you. I mean, there is such a huge open world that you can have with your skills, you control so many devices. Even your phone is probably running Linux or some version based on Linux. So uh, many of these commands you used on Linux, you can also use on Macs. Not, not all of them, of course. But what's important to know, you do have the skills. You do have wings now. You can fly away. Just you don't really know how to fly yet. And when it comes for security, for encryption, decryption, it's always good to ask for advice. And it's good to ask several people so that you're really sure that, uh, that it's good. You can automatize your life. You will probably change many of the things you are doing right now in a rather inefficient way in order to become more efficient. But again, take your time. This is a very fun, but it's also, you know, it, it goes on the head. I, I've been using Linux for several years now, and every month I am learning something totally new. It's a huge topic, and it's really interesting. You go as far as you want. Uh, there are no limits. The only limit is your time and your fantasy. So what's coming up is the expert course. Uh, you saw that my Windows behave, my, like my window management behaves differently than yours. I don't have superposing windows. It's tiling. 
uh, which I consider a much more efficient way to interact. So Aline is going to do like the one with the penguin uh, smiling so happily and waving her hands now. She's going to do the expert course. Um, it's called an expert course, but you are right now at exactly that level, which we consider sufficient for the expert course. So don't miss that. It's really a cool, a cool thing to see. Um, if you like this stuff, if you really feel that this is something that you want to go more, you can become part of our community. Several ways to do that. One is just come one and then at a stammtisch. Absolutely, you know, um, yeah, I, I, I remember you. So um, by the way, there's feedbacks being distributed right now. Um, this is your way to influence the course of next semester. So it'd be really great uh, if you write anything that you liked, you disliked, any opinions, whatever you want to tell us. So Stammtische are, you can come without signing up. Just come in, first beer will be on us, and then you can talk. You can get inspired, inspire us. It's just, you know, we're students. We absolutely know uh, people who do anything else than studying. Totally ordinary, so you will, I think, get along with us very well. You can help if you, uh, if you have some Linux experience, come to our install events. We install about 300 machines every semester. And this is a great opportunity. We have many friends, like Project Neptune, for example. They will give us the machines, three or four or five machines, whatever we want. They give us so we can try them out before they even get sold. So bleeding edge, brand new technology, and you can do whatever you want because they're going to wipe the hard drive anyway. So if you want to become part of us, like become friends with us, we are really a good team, I think. Uh, we don't ever have bigger rows like yelling at each other and stuff, we just don't have that because there's no need for it. We have this common goal and we are very different, very diverse. That is something very important. Every single one of us would do it differently. We are t uh, about 30 people, every one of us would have told you a completely different uh, way to say it. So a course is not probably the best way to tell you. The best way to tell you is you come to us and you discuss with us and you get inspired by every single one doing their things differently. And then that way, of course, you will get to know many people from us, talking about Linux, but many people from ETH and University of Zurich as well. And we have many, uh, really many connections in those uh, sections. So that way you will learn a great deal. And if you want to start your own project later on, you will have many connections already established. OK, I think that is everything. Um, thanks a lot for coming. I will be staying here. If you want to have any questions, that's fine. If you want to go have a drink somewhere, that's perfectly fine for me too. I have nothing else to do this evening reserved for you. Thanks a lot.